I'm Thomas Mobat. I'm the owner and an engineer and producer here at Iliki Music Productions in Hilo, Hawaii. Uh, I've been recording for about 35 years now. Uh, from um, 1988, I started working. Long time, I know. And uh, hundreds of bands, Probably, probably about a thousand, at least a thousand songs. I lost track of how many songs I've, I've tracked, but hundreds of bands, thousands of songs. Uh, started in Chicago, Illinois uh, until 2002. I moved out here to the big island of Hawaii, and uh, I've been here almost 20 years. It'll be 20 years next spring. Uh, I opened up a studio here in Hilo, which is on the east side of the island, um, and um, yeah. I, You've had this studio for 20 years here? Yeah, 20 years in this, in this room, in this, this uh, Great. Yeah, 20 years down here. Uh, yeah. uh, and um, I do all kinds of music from uh, singer-songwriter, acoustic, uh, pop rock, alternative rock. I've done my fair share of heavy metal and thrash music, uh, a little bit of jazz, some bluegrass, some hip-hop and rap. <laughs> Uh, just about anything you can put a microphone in front of. We've done them down here. A bit of advertising sometimes. Um, also, I've got a, a special interest in soundtrack music, instrumental soundtrack music, orchestral uh, theme music for television and, and film. You have a lot yeah. of instruments here, I noticed. Yeah, room. yeah. We've we've collected a few over the years. Yeah, I'll. I'll, I'll go show you. I'll give you a whole studio tour sometime and show you the, the drums and we've got guitars and amps. Uh, replaced a lot of the amps really with, with some of the plugins that are available now. They're a lot easier on an old guy like me. You don't have to lug around uh, big, expensive, heavy amplifiers. And that now you can plug into a, a computer and get those tones without, without the hassle. Amazing. So, yeah, yeah. So, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, today I'm going to go over the very basics, which uh, for a lot of people it's going to be sort of a beginner level thing, but I do, I do want to start with the basics of the recording chain, which is really microphones. And if it's a little bit elemental to, to you, um, you, can, you can skip past this, but I, I wanted to start with some of the basics about uh, microphones, and that's really the first thing you're going to deal with as an engineer. Mm -hmm. Uh, besides obviously having a space to record in, having a room where you can put up some microphones is something we can talk about at another time. Microphone yeah. placement. Yeah, microphone placement and, and the choice of microphones, a little bit about the history of these mics. Great. Uh, yeah, we can spend some more time some other time talking about the acoustics of rooms and uh, soundproofing and whatnot. I'll go into all that. But today I wanted to kind of go over a couple of these uh, new mics. I, I've been using uh, this mic uh, here before. Um, uh, this is actually a brand new one. I've, I've replaced the old one with a brand new microphone. Um, and uh, uh, this one I just got as well. Uh, and I'll talk about the combination of those two mics in a second. One of the, one of the first things I wanted to go over was the, um, the use, use of, a, of a windscreen, which is what you see right here in front. Uh, some people call it a windscreen or you can call it a pop screen or a popper stopper. Those are all the same thing, but it's basically this contraption that goes out in front of the microphone here. Uh, it's a screen mesh. Uh, I think this is metal or plastic. It feels like metal, but this is a professionally made popper stopper. And what that's going to do is when you are close to a microphone like this and you are singing or talking and you hit what are called plosives, which are P's and B's, uh, if you put your hand in front of your mouth, you can feel those that P and that B. Uh, hitting your hand, that little uh, explosion of air. Um, the popper stopper is going to keep that air from getting into your microphone. And what that will do when it hits that microphone is create a little boom. Uh, it's not really loud, but it, it will disrupt your recording. And um, it's kind of annoying. So the simple application of a, a popper stopper like this, uh, right in front of your mic, is going to take care of that problem. It's like breaking up the air pressure or something. Exactly. This exactly what it does. The, these these little screens uh, break up that big breath of air into lots of little pieces of air, and that won't disturb your microphone. It doesn't affect the uh, audio in any way. It doesn't take away any of the sibilance or 
Uh, so it's one of the first investments. Obviously, you're going to need a microphone and, uh, and a mic stand and a cable, but I would say one of the first things you should get is a good quality uh, popper stopper. Uh, I've talked in the past about making your own, which you can do uh, if you're on a desert island and you need to, or in a situation like a backyard barbecue or something where uh, you don't have a popper stopper, uh, you can make one out of a pair of um, old pantyhose and you get a coat hanger and a coffee can and wrap that, wrap a loop around that coffee can, create a loop with your coat hanger, duct tape it like a lollipop at the bottom, take out the coffee can, <laughs> and then stretch a pair of uh, your girl's uh, uh, pantyhose, preferably uh, clean ones, and um, stretch them and, and duct tape them, and then you've got, a, you've got a basic, a, a homemade windscreen. The problem with that is it doesn't look pretty. And you know, it's fun if you've been drinking and you want to have a good time with your friends. And you get, it's better than nothing. But I would say, you know, take the 40 to $60 necessary to invest in a good quality popper stopper. And it looks much better. It's, it's where your singer is going to be standing. You might be the singer, but you're going to be standing there working all the time. You don't want to have your nose up in some old pair of pantyhose, you know. Uh, it's just not a professional look. So I'm, I'm going to stop recommending people do that make it a small investment and you can get any number of different ones. Um, here's one that is uh, from Amazon for about 20 bucks. I don't recommend it. It's, uh, it looks like it'll do the job. It does do the job. There's nothing wrong with it, but I've just noticed that when you clamp it on, it tends not to stay where you want it to, to stay. It's a little, it's a little flimsy. I, I'll use it in, in a pinch when I need a second or a third one, but I wouldn't recommend the, the, the cheap variety uh, from Amazon. Um, there are other brands on Amazon, I'm sure, but this is not the one. Uh, if I go here, here's a different one from Sure Microphones, which we'll talk about in a second. This is a good quality one. This, I think, was about $40. And they're all the same. They'll all get this little gooseneck flexible thing. This one stays put. And it is not made of a mesh like this. It's made out of a, uh, more like a pantyhose material. Uh, and that's... Yeah. That's kind of on both sides. It's a double, and that works really well. Uh, it stays put. These just clip on the stand like that, and you can uh -huh. typically put it about three, two, three, four inches away from the microphone. If you want to put it back eight or nine inches, you can. If somebody's singing really big, you could put it back farther. But I like having the, the singer nice and close on the microphone, so they can scooch right up on that and get a get a really intimate lovely sound right up on the mic. It sounds like they're singing right in your ear. Um, so that's a good one with um, from Shure. Uh, one little trick is that because it is a fabric material, uh, people are singing at it all day, uh, it gets a little stinky sometimes, you know? So one of the things you can do is get a decent quality little vaporizer, a little, a little uh, you can use uh, just about anything you like, whatever scent you like, and Take it off, take it away from the microphone when you do it. But you can kind of spray that a little bit and uh, dry it off and that'll keep that thing smelling, smelling fresh every time. So when your singer comes in, they're not smelling the last singer. <laughs> uh, little things like that will make your, your singers a lot more, a lot happier. Um, anyway, that's that one. And then this one I, I think was about 60 bucks. Looks like a company called Stedman. I got this from Sweetwater and uh, it, it works great. This one you don't have to worry so much about the um, the fabric. So it's... That's a metal mesh. Yeah, I think this is a metal mesh with a... This this feels like rubber. So it's plastic, rubber, and metal. Real solid made. I, mean, I like that one. Yeah, this microphone is uh, made by a company named Warm Audio out of Austin, Texas. Uh, they've been making uh, replica microphones from some of the most desirable mics in history. Uh, some of the most expensive and hard to find old German microphones uh, that would cost upwards of $10,000. Uh, they're making them now for um, much less, uh, very affordable for your uh, for guys like me that can't afford that much money for a mic. They sound great. Uh, they look great. They look just about like the real thing if you've ever had an opportunity to look at a Neumann U47, which is a famous old mic from the 40s. Um, that mic was made famous by lots of people. You know, um, Frank Sinatra 
loved his uh, U-47, Nat King Cole, Sarah Vaughn, the Beach Boys, um, I mean, this list goes on and on, Ray Charles, uh, Jim Morrison, they, uh, a lot of male voices especially were sounded really great on the old Neumann U-47, uh, a very hard to find mic now, very old, hard to keep up, the tubes are hard to find. Uh, this company, Warm Audio, is, I think, one of the, one of the greatest new little companies. Uh, it's an American company. Uh, the, the parts are from all over the world. They partner with a lot of different companies from around the world to, to find these parts, and they buy them in bulk at good prices, so they're able to keep their price point on these mics low. They're uh, designed and assembled and inspected in Texas. So I'm not sure they manufacture them all in, in America, but they are all designed inspected and uh, uh, approved before they go out. Uh, every, every mic is, is uh, uh, inspected in Texas before they go out. I think it looks great. It's, you know, a lot of people are saying you can't, it's very hard to tell the difference between the microphones, especially in a mix with other instruments. Um, they're really they're very impeccable mic. Warm Audio offers a lot of other mics. If you want to take a look at their website or online, um, they make a, a bunch of great mics. I chose this one just as my main vocal mic. I, I wanted a, a workhorse that could work on just about anything from, obviously I've got it set up here for vocals. Uh, you can set it up for acoustic guitar, uh, strings, just about anything. Um, I'm not sure it would be the best mic on percussion and drums as a close mic, but using it as an overhead mic on drums or a, a room mic, uh, it would, it would really well at that. Um, it can handle really loud sound pressure levels. Um, not a lot of fancy switches or anything on it. There's really not much to the mic itself. Um, there is a little box, a uh, little power supply that um, they provide that does have um, uh, nine different patterns on it, all the way from a, a cardioid, which is basically picking up just what's right out in front of it here, to a figure eight, which is going to pick up front and back and also an Omni, which is gonna create a 360 degree uh, field around it. So you can adjust it and, and several points in between those. So you can, you can combine them. If you don't wanna you know, complete cardio, you can open that up into more of, an, of a, the next position, which is gonna be an Omni. You could, you could open that microphone up to get a little bit more of the room. Um, the power supply is nice because you don't have to provide phantom power from your, your mixing board. Uh, you just come in, turn on the power supply. It's got a nice blue light so you don't forget to turn it off at the end of the day. And uh, that's where everything, it, it's got a very high quality seven pin cable that plugs from the microphone to the unit. That's not a regular mic cable, that's a special cable that comes with it. And then you just plug the output from it, which is a regular um, XLR straight into your, your system. Let me put that back on here. Shure SM7B is the name of this microphone from Shure Microphones. Uh, they're a Chicago-based company, and they've been around forever. They've been around since I think they started in 1928. Wow. So almost 100 years, uh, coming up on 100 years. Um, started by uh, uh, a gentleman, uh, Shure, uh, SC Shure, I think is his, is his name, and later on his brother joined him, so it was a two, the two Shure brothers started this mic. Uh, they were making mics before World War II. Uh, they were making mics that bombardiers used in airplanes in noisy conditions. They were mounted to the throat or the chest so you could hear each other in, in a plane. Uh, so yeah, really, really cool history on that company if you want to go check out uh, Shure online. There's a fascinating uh, history to them. Um, radio, evidently. Yeah, they started, their, their claim to fame was the uh, uh, Sure, 55 Unidyne microphone, which I think you've probably seen. Everybody knows it as the Elvis mic. It's the mic that Elvis held like this. It has a really distinctive look. It looked like sort of the front end of an old car. Yeah. You know, you remember that one? And, yeah, yeah, it looked beautiful and it, uh, it had a nice grill on it. Um, it was one of the first uh, microphones of its type um, and it caught on. They made several versions of it after that. They're still making it today. It, it, you'll see it in a lot of videos just because it has such a distinct look. Uh, also, it's, it sounded great too. Uh, very, very workhorse microphone. Um, the SM7 uh, was the original uh, 
uh, vocal mic, this one they put out for, for uh, broadcasters, newscasters, radio. Um, you'll see it a lot in podcasts these days. Um, has a very great uh, quality to it. It has a lot of low end response, so you get that deep radio broadcaster's voice. Um, you can get right up on it, and this, this uh, windscreen that's built onto it uh, will protect the microphone from those plosives. I still park this in front of it more for this microphone than for that one. You don't need it so much with this microphone. You can you can get right up on that. And is it's, that foam? Yeah. yeah, this is a foam also. Cover. Yeah, it's a foam cover. And the, the the microphone capsule is actually back about an inch and a half back in there, so there's a little bit of an air gap, just to keep people from getting too close to it. So that that really you'll see these hanging, two or three of these hanging in a radio station, and uh, they're strong mics. They can they can take a. a, a a beating um, and boy they sound great um, I I started um, using one uh, in this combination with the uh, uh, just call this the 47 um, having two microphones together like that uh, is going to capture the same sound source onto two different tracks uh, allowing me to blend those two different tones later this old vintage sound very crisp silky bottomy uh, uh, old school kind of microphone with a more modern uh, broadcast microphone. Having that combination is really gives you some nice options during mix down that you wouldn't get with just one mic or the other. You might decide that you just wanted to use this mm -hmm. this voice, but maybe your singer's really belting it out super loud and this, this just isn't sounding good. I mean, it'll work, but I, it might just sound better over here. Um, you, can, you can switch over to that mic. Um, this mic was made famous uh, really, by besides a lot of radio announcers, but um, it, it's got a, a reputation for being uh, Michael Jackson's microphone. It was really the main microphone they used on Thriller. Um, his engineer could have chosen any mic in, in their mic locker. They had, you know, great mics. They went with this one on Michael. They just decided it sounded the best. Uh, it's a $350 microphone, you know, and, uh, you know, it's also used by... Um, Red Hot Chili Peppers uses it almost exclusively on vocals uh, for that very, that sound that's right in your face. Um, they, they say that if, if uh, there's a, a microphone that recorded the voice inside your head, that that's the microphone oh, yeah. that they would use. Yeah, it's, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. Um, so you only know with experience that combo works to use those two mics. Yeah, I, I picked this up from a, um, uh, a producer that I had the good fortune of working with when I was back in North Carolina. I was working at a studio in North Carolina and uh, the producer flew down and used this on his singer, which was uh, a big guy with a hat and a harmonica. Um, it was in, in North Carolina on tour and they needed to do some work in our studio. So they came by and flew the producer down and um, he requested that I, they, had, they actually had a, a Neumann uh, U80, uh, U, U47, excuse me, and but he said that sounds great put up an sm7 as well and i was like really okay I'd, I'd never done that before uh i'd, I'd used two microphones but not that particular combination and so we dropped uh, uh the, one of the original sm7s i don't think they make them anymore but the seven sm7b's are the ones now and boy that that sounded just great on on that particular singer uh that singer has a tendency to be very quiet and intimate and then he'll go full voice, and he's a big guy, and he would just belt it out. Um, he did some other stuff with his harmonica that we didn't use these mics for. That was run through a Marshall cabinet, but that's another story. But anyway, that's where I got the idea of, of these two particular mics, and that's why I have them up like this. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, the um, the SM7 is basically uh, going to be almost the same microphone as this one right here. This is a talk about a desert. Island microphone. This is a Shure SM57. Uh, this mic has been around since I think 1965, I believe. And uh, this, if I was on a desert island, this is probably the microphone that I wanted uh, most of all. It really is a great mic. Um, it does not have any kind of a windscreen, so if you get up on it like this, you're going to get a lot of those P's and B's and, and plosives. Um, very, very similar to the SM7B. They designed this mic just for, uh, to get a little bit more um, distance between the announcer and the, the tip of the mic. Uh -huh. 
and they also built in some handling noises. They, they built some shock uh, resistors in this to keep this mic from getting a bump. If, if you bump the stand or something like that, it's, it's not going to pick up the same kind of noises as this mic. But really, the, the, about $100. Uh, you can grab one of these for about $100. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can make records with just this. Um, you know, obviously, if you can get a better uh, setup like I have, that's great. But if you're, if you're just starting out, I'd highly recommend be picking up one of these, maybe a couple of these. Uh, they're great on guitar cabinets, vocals. Uh, you could do acoustic instruments like acoustic guitars and stuff with them. Drums. Drums. I mean, you'll use this. Everybody still goes for these on snare drums. You know, look in any, any drum kit. Uh, on, on, you know, you'll see this on the snare drum most of the time. Most of the time. Um, they put this mic out in uh, 50, 50, uh, 65 or 66. I got to check on that. But the year later, one year later, they, they brought this out. It's identical. This is a Shure SM58. That's the 57. This is the 58. And basically the exact same microphone. The only difference is they added this uh, windscreen on top. Let me go and open that up for you. And you'll see it looks identical. Pretty much identical. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to take this off right now. That is but that's, that's the same mic. This is a windscreen that keeps so much of that plosive from getting onto that capsule. So you, this is the most popular mic in history, the SM58. Um, handheld mic, uh, you'll see this used all over the place. This is a, a, a workhorse of a mic. They say you could hammer nails with it. I've never tried that. One of the nice things about it is if you do drop this mic, like the famous mic drop that you see a lot of guys doing, right. it's an engineer's nightmare. Like you just dropped a hundred dollar mic on the ground and this mic probably would break it. You know, if it hit like that, uh, you're probably going to destroy that mic. So I'm not a big fan of the mic drop, but if you do drop that mic and hits like that, this is going to, it's like a crumple zone on a car that's going to dent that, but it's not going to break the capsule. And then you can unscrew that and go in there with a, um, like a wooden spoon, the back end of a wooden spoon, and just kind of push that dent out, and the mic is going to be fine. Over the years, this will take a beating, and it'll, it'll look less than, this is a brand new mic I just got. It'll, it, uh, it'll look like hell after a while, especially if it's used in nightclubs or concerts, you know. But they, they will work forever. Um, uh, anyway, that's, that's the uh, SM, sure SM58. Looks like one that they, uh, everyone knocks off and makes their... Yeah. Yeah, there's they, they have them with a switch also. I, I prefer not to have a switch on there, but um, if you're gonna make records, you can make make them with this microphone. Uh, you might want to for about five bucks more. You can get an additional little windscreen for it. They have them in different colors, but isn't that nice? There you go. Yeah. yeah, and that's you can give that to your singer in the you know if you're doing a, a vocal right while the band's recording and you don't have your vocal booth set up right now, maybe you're using your room for drums or a guitar or something, you can give this to your singer right in your control room. He can stand right next to you, right behind you, or in the bathroom even, and just plug that in and let him sing. And that might be a scratch vocal, a temporary vocal, but a lot of the time that'll be just fine, just like that. You might, you know, these, these mics sound great. I mean, a lot of people say they sound just as great as this, this mic, but I mean, so if you want to get it a little more professional, you can go a little farther and again buy something like that. This is actually the uh, the windscreen that came with that microphone. Uh, uh, you can take this off and put this on but I, I'm fine with this. You can put this, you can order these separately if you want and that fits very nicely on that 58 and you don't have to squinch it all the way down, leave a little bit, leave that air gap in there and that'll that'll really stop that plosive from happening. So that, that is probably a, a broadcast quality situation nice. right there. Yeah, isn't that nice? And, you know, so if you don't have a, a lot of money for the big expensive microphones right now, I get it. I was there. Um, get yourself a combination like that. I'm not sure if that's going to fit with the 57. Let's see. And, and what are they no, it's too loosey-goosey. <laughs> you can't do it. <laughs> but anyway, that's my plug for sure. Uh, those two mics will get you a long way. Right there. 
These are both dynamic microphones as opposed to condenser microphones. Uh -huh. They don't require power uh, like this, micro this microphone here does. You have to provide it with the power from the, the unit. Or uh, dynamic uh, condenser microphones are often powered from the mixing board. You can turn on what's called phantom power and that'll send uh, a voltage to power the microphone. These don't require them. Um, so um, that's kind of nice. They reintroduced these mics in 1989, I believe, um, as the Shure SM57B or Beta uh -huh. and the uh, Shure SM58 Beta. Uh, they look very similar. The grill was a little different. It had a blue stripe on them. Um, the main difference besides that was they had a higher output um, as they're not powered microphones, so that with the improvement, they they had a lot more output uh, to the mixing board. Were they um, for singers or reporters? This one mainly for singers. The 58. Um, this you can use on everything else. Instruments. And Drums, amps. Guitars. Uh, you know, I saw Tom Petty in concert, and he was using these. All, all of his singers had these instead of these. You'd think the 58 would be the way to go, but. Tom Petty was using all 57s, and he was right up on it. I don't know how they did that, but um, so yeah, the the, the beta versions uh, looked a little different, had more power. They also had uh, uh, more of a hypercardioid uh, pattern uh, as opposed to a cardioid, which meant that as the singer, um, it's going to reject a lot more of the sides and the back. So if you, it's going to get right right in front of it, right. kind of like a shotgun mic. Right like on top. Yeah, it's going to get right. It's, it's a little more directional, so it's going to reject the stage noise, um, cymbals, audience, stuff like that. So more of a hyper. But um, either way, you can't go wrong. So, nice. um, what do they I, run? Each of these mics runs about less than $100. Oh, super. Yeah, comes with a clip, a little, little case. Um, so sweet, sweet combination right there. If, if you only had two microphones, those are probably the twos I would, one of each. And you, what are you could, they again? Uh, sure SM57 and Sure SM58. Call your Sweetwater representative today. <laughs> Operators are standing by. <laughs> I'll show you a couple others that I have here. Uh, Great. Pulled out from the the, like, the mic locker. Um, these two guys, they're identical. Uh, aren't they beautiful? Twins. Yeah. You can see they've taken a little bit more of a beating. I actually purchased these the, the, uh, when I bought a one my my first drum kit. Um, my first real drum kit was uh, I purchased from a guy in Chicago, and he threw these in uh, in part of the deal. He just gave me, he, he didn't need them. <laughs> but these are Shure microphones. Um, these are called Unispheres. They were very popular in the 70s. Uh, these were probably, I, I probably saw them more than I saw the 58. The 58, very similar, obviously. Very similar. I think these were probably just before the 58. Uh, so the, they came out in the 60s. But, um, What's the difference in sound between the two? Uh, they obviously look similar, but... You know, Tim, I don't know the answer to that question, so we're going to edit that out. <laughs> to be honest, to be honest, I don't know that much about these microphones. Uh, I know that they look beautiful. Um, they still work. You know, um, I got I got to look into the history of these a little bit more. The Unisphere ones, um, or you know, if anybody's watching this, they can text me if you well, own like, these mics. We yeah. like pairs, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, these these you can see when when they these have been dropped a little bit and that they've been dented up a little bit. Yeah. They they work great. They've got some um, character. Yeah, I, I love these on music videos. I'll put one of these up just because they look so yeah. bling, they're bling. You know, they just have a Again, a retro quality, yeah. not a 50s quality. They're more, more like a 70s quality to them. They're just, 70s, and they, 80s flat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They look great under lights and color. Good so with the yeah. hairband. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what I got. I got to do more research on these or, or send in, in any information that you have on them. I'd love to. I'd love to hear Super. more about them. Yeah. Again, if you're going to use something like that, you know, put your little windscreen on or much more usable. So you can still use it handheld. You know. The mic drop. Yeah, it's it'll protect from that too. But I'm a big fan of catching uh, live vocals in the studio. Um, obviously, when you do a recording in the studio, you're going to go back later 
and overdub your vocals. You know, everybody's done, the song is mixed or getting, getting mixed, and the last thing you're gonna do is add those vocals and those background vocals. Mm. Um, it's funny though, that's the last thing you do. In early recordings, the singer was right there. Frank Sinatra had the band right behind him. You know, uh, uh, in the studio often, the band was all playing, the Beatles, you've seen them, they're all playing around, the singer's right there, he's singing at the same time. Now. Yeah, in the Looking now, and now it's an after. It's not an afterthought. It's the last thing you do, and uh, yeah, the wrecking crew right there. Yeah, they're jamming, you know. And so I'm a big fan of what I call a scratch vocal or a temp vocal on day one when the band is recording. Um, you want to have a singer there and singing along with the band, so the band knows where they are in the song. I mean, if you've ever tried to have the band play it without the vocals they usually get lost they're not sure or the singer can say okay we're gonna take it you know take it to the soul you can you can make it into a live session it and tighter. yeah and a lot of the times if you get a good quality recording even with a you know a hundred dollar microphone that's going to have a lot of energy to it it's going to have that yeah. liveliness to it um so always always get a, a scratch vocal uh on day one uh, you'll get some bleed in there you'll hear some drums maybe some guitars maybe somebody you know opening a beer but that's all kind of part of the part of the magic, I think, you know, and it's something that's lost. Makes sense. Yeah, um, totally makes sense. Yeah, you'd be surprised how much of that early vocal might be used in in later takes, though. I mean, um, so, but you got to have a a mic like this that the singer can hold or put it on a stand like this. You can put it on a stand, and if you don't want to do all that, put it behind that, and then you don't need all this. You can just mount it just like that. Sure. I often do uh, vocals out in the kitchen. The way my studio set up, the, the the drum booth is being used. This room is often used for for guitar cabinets, or a percussionist, or a horn player, something loud. I'm going to put the bass player out with me in the booth. I mean, the control room, excuse me, and uh, maybe a keyboard out in the control room with me. So there's no place for the singer to stand, but in the kitchen. So I'll I'll put a, a nice long cable. I'll put a nice long cable on here, and he can he can. Go wherever he wants. He, no headphones. He's just hearing it from the speakers, and he can he can move around. And uh, it, it's it's a great suggestion for for uh, you know. Yeah. You can go in the bathroom, in a closet. If you've got a a, a pantry or a, a coat closet. Closets are great. They're like a little vocal booth. You can go in there and you know give him some headphones in there and yeah. So. But, uh, great idea. Yeah. This is an AKG D112 microphone. Oh, it is? Yeah, this is, this is not a Shure microphone. Uh, oh. This is a, a kick drum microphone. It's been around forever. Uh, really, not, not particularly expensive mic. A few hundred bucks, you can get one of these and put it in your kick drum. Uh, just inside, the, if you've got a hole cut in your front head, you can just put it just inside there, and that'll get you a great kick drum sound right away. Uh, that's the front of the mic. This is the back. I used to make that mistake. Anyway. Um, very durable mic. It can take a beating if you drop it or um, something hits it, a stick or any like that. Is there a reason all that venting is at the back there for the percussion? You know, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I'm probably going to do a little more research on AKG and their line of microphones. They make some great stuff. I think the predecessor to this was the D12, pretty sure. It's a famous low response microphone for kick drums. A little more expensive, but a great, a great mic. Do those foam, uh, foamies act as uh, pop filters? Yes, they do. Yeah, these will definitely, um, the bigger the better, you know. If you, the best thing to do is to put your mic on a stand and put a pop screen right in front of it. Then you don't need that, you don't need one of these. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't hurt, but if you have it back there, you're just fine. Where you're going to need one of these is if you're out, well, obviously, if you're outdoors, that's going to keep wind noise yeah. from distorting that signal. But if you're in a studio, the only reason you would need one of these is if you're going handheld, which is fun for the singer. He can walk around. He can look at the drummer through the glass. He can go wherever he wants or he, she wants. And, uh, but you just drop one of those on top of there, and that'll, that'll make that audio a lot more usable. They will stop plosives. Um, doesn't fit so well on this guy. See, that's that's made for that. It will it will stop that plosive quite a bit. A bigger one will stop more. Uh, that's your best bet, though.
Uh, this this will keep other things like spit from getting on the mic. Um, so and is yeah. your uh, warm audio use something like that also? No, for the U forty seven, the WA forty seven. Uh, no, you don't. I haven't seen any kind of a a pop something like that for that. No, no foam it's a good question. Be, what do you do if you're outdoors with a U47? You know, that's a good question. I'm sure that there's something that would fit on that. Not this one. Yeah, but, probably, um, probably have one. You yeah. know, who, who made these old mics really famous was our old boy uh, Adolf. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, Neumann was from the 1940s. And if you look at some of those old um, uh, Nazi videos of Hitler just rambling off like a crazy man. Um, I don't know, I don't think those are U47s, but those were Neumann microphones, those old German mics. They were beauties. I mean, they had big long necks on them and big huge capsules and he would be out there just going crazy. But those are those, that that's a German company that we could talk more about. They have a huge history. Uh, are they still in business? Yes, they are. Yeah, they sure are. And they've got into, they've, they're making other things now. They decided to get into the speaker business. They make their own speakers. Um, they make um, uh, very expensive microphones. You know? They make uh, lab mics? Yes, they do. Very expensive lab mics. Their, their least expensive mic is about the same price as one of these. You can get a, a Neumann TLM-103, I believe it is. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, Neumann microphone. It doesn't have the length that this one. It's a little bit shorter. But if you can afford Neumann microphones, that's great. I, I, I can't, you know, I'm a project studio and I like being able to offer, you know, I'd rather have two or three different microphones for different situations sure. than just one really expensive one. I mean, if you can go out and buy a $10,000 Neumann, great, you know, great. I, I'm not that rich. Uh, that's why I like warm audio. They're, they're really, um, Knocking it out of the ballpark um, on on re reinventing mm -hmm. and remanufacturing these they these have a, mics. A good catalog of mics. They sure do. Uh, I think I've got one here. Funny, you should ask. Yeah, they do have a, a nice catalog. Um, all their stuff's really nice quality. Uh, I think it's out of Texas. It, it's I think it's out of Austin, Texas. I got to double check on that, but. They might, have, they might have a couple different buildings. Looks like they make um, more than uh, microphones. They do. They've got uh, vintage uh, EQs. Uh, they've got compressors. These are all emulating older pieces of gear like the LA-2A uh, compressor. Uh, they've got Neve. Um, so like, like the universal. 1073. Mm -hmm. there's, a double, there's a 70. Oh, that's like an 1176 style compressor. Um, there, I think, you know, I'm, I'm talking about these older companies like Shure and Neumann, the great companies. They've been around a hundred years or so, but, uh, you know, these guys just started in 2011. They've been through the pandemic and they're, they're getting some really, uh, Sylvia Macy is, is involved with their, they've got a nice studio. They built a, a state of the art studio down in Texas now. I mean, talk about a dream job. Uh, they're bringing in some heavy, heavy hitter producers and engineers, um, so yeah, I would, I would highly recommend uh, this company for people that have a budget, but not a huge budget. I mean, these are not cheap, these are not cheap devices. There's a, a, a 73 style British uh, EQ. That's, that's, that's like a, a Neve a 1073 right so there. Similar yeah. to Universal Audio in that respect. On the yeah, even more price conscious. Yeah, they are. Yeah, so I, this is a company to watch out for. Um, so um, we'll, be, we'll be taking a look at some more of their gear uh, later, but uh, there's, there's some of the microphones that I have. All kinds of re, re, uh, reissued versions. There's the 47 like I've got. There's a bunch of them. So I'd go online, check them out. There's the Neumann U87 uh, emulation. 251. 67. You know, I know. endless, right, endless. Come to now for mics. I'm telling you, right? That's it. It's crazy. Yeah, so... Feel free to feel free to contact uh, contact us if you have any questions about anything we've discussed today, or if you want to uh, correct me on anything. I'm not an expert uh, at a lot of things, but yeah. if you want to correct me or update me, or if you'd like to uh, hear about other mics that you're interested in, let me know. And definitely, blow. definitely, yeah, definitely. If you're starting a studio or have a studio and you're looking to improve it and update your gear, you're um, grow it. yeah, get get in touch with us because we're in the same boat. You know, we're doing the same thing. So. Cool. Yeah, thank you. All right. Aloha.